Hello again Scotland fans and welcome back and this time we're going to do things just a little bit differently. We've been talking a lot about historical attractions around Scotland recently mm -hmm. but what we also get as experienced travel writers in Scotland we get asked about how best to experience this little country that we live in. What are the best ways to go about things, what are the best things to see, places to stay, things to eat, mm -hmm. distilleries to visit, you name it. So what we're going to do is answer your questions directly here and now and you can obviously leave follow-up questions in the comments for this video and as well as that, you can also ask us on social media across whatever channels that we're using. These questions that we're going to answer today are just some of the FAQs that we've been asked most recently. So, shall we dive straight in? And one of the questions, probably the question that I get asked more than any other, is what is the best time of year to visit Scotland? Yeah, which really depends on what you're after, right? Yeah. I mean, if you have particular affinity for, you know, autumn colours and the leaves changing, well, there's your answer. But with most things, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, personally, um, I like to, you know, I'm a little bit greedy, I think, when I visit places, I like to have them more or less to myself, you know, to vary yeah. degrees wherever possible. So if you're looking for a bit of a quieter time of the year to visit, but which is still quite good for weather, and you know daylight length all that good stuff my favorite time to go exploring around Scotland is usually sort of September early October and then right before the peak summer sort of May can sometimes still be a bit dicey a bit more yeah. like winter than spring really um, but uh, sort of June July um, I find is ideal um, now that is coming from someone who lives in Edinburgh um, so you'll notice what's missing there is August when the Fringe Festival happens <laughs> and everything just goes nuts yes. Um, so if you are really big into cultural events then yeah that time of year especially in Edinburgh is ideal um, but if you're just generally looking to do some more exploring make sure that you know historic locations are open you've got a reasonably good chance for decent weather for hikes and all that kind of stuff I would say sort of early summer and early autumn are ideal for me anyway yeah. how about for you Traditionally, that is, has been very much the case. That's, mm. that's the best answer. So May, June and September, October tend to be overall, I think, the best mm -hmm. times when you've got the best balance. You have to take a lot into account. If you do love it, as you say, you love your solitude and you want it to yourself. Winter, of course, you're going to get more likely to, to experience that, but you're dealing with shorter days and probably not the best weather. So this time of year, things can be quite tough in terms of getting up north, especially. It is a challenge. A lot of things are closed. In the peak summer months, July and August, you're going to be dealing with issues around availability, so yeah. things are, are generally chock a block. You're also dealing with the midgy, um, <laughs> our favourite yeah. little friend. They are their most prolific in the summer months. So if you think mosquitoes are bad, they've got nothing on yeah. midges. I can say yeah. as someone who's experienced plenty of both, yeah, they, they swarm upon yeah. you. Um, they're not quite as vicious as mosquitoes, but they're definitely more annoying. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have horrible little things, and they are they are particularly bad in the northwest as well. So if you're going to the likes of Sky, the summer is going to be is going to be tough going if midges are going to be all over you. So that's something to factor in. As you see, the autumn colours are a big thing in September and October. But climate change has changed everything as well, so it's very difficult to predict what kind of weather we're going to face. You can get freak Absolutely. weeks. Uh, and even, even March, we had a freak couple of weeks ago, a couple of years ago, sorry. Um, there was a freak week in March where it was 21 degrees, and that's obscene. Yeah. Um, there does tend to be a, a week in March or so where yeah. summer happens, and then that's it. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. quite quickly back to winter. But no matter what time of year you visit, the main thing is to just do your homework and be prepared ahead of time, um, especially if you are visiting around peak season. Availability, as you say, can be a major issue. Um, I have been disappointed on several occasions trying to book a trip quite impulsively up to the highlands to find that there is nothing affordable available left so plan at least a few weeks in advance regardless of what time of year you're coming would be my yeah. top tip for you yes without a doubt okay question two i think we've hopefully answered that pretty well yeah <laughs> so um Leading on from that, um, you'll find you know that the same locations tend to get a lot of the fanfare, especially on social media. So leading from that, a lot of our uh, viewers and readers have asked, are there any places left in Scotland that aren't jam-packed full of other tourists? The short answer is yes, of course. Um, but you have to yeah. be a bit more original, perhaps. You have to be, in, in the peak season, you have to be thinking um, past just Edinburgh, Glencoe, Loch Ness and Skye, mm -hmm. which is where everyone tends to congregate. The North Coast 500 has become very, very busy yeah. at the moment and we've, we've both talked in length this year about over-tourism and some of these places, these very fragile places being overrun with um, uncontrollable numbers of, of tourists and, mm -hmm. and peak season has to be said. It's not a year-round thing and even on somewhere like Skye though, which has been very, very heavily publicised mm -hmm. as being overrun, 
South Sky is, is largely deserted, so yeah. people tend to go to the same places, and there's, there's half a dozen places on the Sky that get particularly thronged. Yeah. But places that you're going to get off the tourist map, definitely South Scotland, mm -hmm. the Borders, Dumfries and Galloway, even the islands on the West Coast as well. I mean, everyone talks about Sky and Mall and the likes of that, but places like Butte, Col, Colonsay, Tyree, these kind of places tend not to get a typical tourist trail. Yeah, I was on uh, the Isle of Egg actually yep. um, at peak season, yep. and it was so quiet. You know, you mm. wouldn't know that sky was just across the water. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I think it's <laughs> when we talk about the issue of, of over tourism, we're not saying Scotland's full don't come visit here. No. By no means would we ever suggest such a thing. We'd be um, out of work for a start, so don't do that. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be great for us. Um, but the the idea is really just to spread the love a bit more. So if you are planning on coming here in summer, for instance. Um, you know, think about potential alternatives. I mean, Scotland, we like to call it a big wee country. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to see here. Yes. And there is scenery in the Scottish borders, mm -hmm. in Dumfries and Galloway, in Inland Argyle, in yep. the northeast, which, for my mind, is right up there with mm -hmm. any of the best sort of highland mm -hmm. scenery you can get. Slightly different flavour, but still incredibly dramatic. Mm -hmm. So when you're creating your itinerary, it's very much thinking about, yes, you know, hitting some of the classics, because you got to hit those bucket list yeah. locations, yeah. right? But also thinking about how you can structure your trip to get to some of the lesser known, but incredibly rewarding areas of Scotland. And we've made that a big part of our job to try and, and make it about coming to the whole country and not just experiencing the one or two places which have been done to death on um, well, Instagram. It's probably the biggest offender. Yeah, you can't do Scotland in a week. It nope. just cannot happen. Don't um, try. Don't try. You have a terrible time. Yeah, Neil's been living here his whole life. I've been living here for about nine years now, and I'm only just starting to you know sort of repeat myself in places I visit. Yeah. So take your time. I guarantee you will enjoy it so much more if you do. Okay, so next question we have got. Uh, I might be going to uni in Scotland, University in Scotland. Is it friendly to international visitors? Well, that's one for, for David probably to answer first, I think. Yeah, um, I came over to Scotland from Canada to do a um, degree at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm currently studying at the University of Stirling as well. Um, Scotland's got world-class universities. Um, they are impeccable in terms of the level of academia that's coming out of them, the communities they foster, and yes, for being very international. And I think, you know, the uni side of things is just one small slice of, uh, of the pie really in Scotland because society here generally um, is extremely welcoming to people of all stripes. Um, Scotland's got this sort of interesting take on identity which I've honestly found so heartwarming um, which you know is that people like me who have you know, moved here we're called new Scots or just Scots full stop or adopted Scots all kinds of terms but the idea is if you come to Scotland you're welcome here if you make your home in Scotland you are a Scot end of story um, and while Scotland may not be you know the most ethnically diverse nation in the world by a long shot um, it's got this incredibly internationalist perspective um, which is almost unceasingly welcoming it's hard to believe yeah, <laughs> almost. Yeah. Um, but you know that's my experience as someone who has come here from somewhere else mm. what's your take on that as a, a native it's, it's, hard, it's hard to comment as a native because you just kind of take it for granted in many mm. ways um, i'm aware that scots are generally more friendly than most um mm. we're, we're quite we're, we're, we're like fairness as a country yeah. so we're all big big fans of, of free education wherever it's, it's possible mm. so it's very much about doing what you can for society as a whole we do have a big heart the scots i think for, for the most part that's not to say that um, it's a completely crime free free utopia or anything there are parts of scotland which i don't necessarily recommend mm -hmm. i've seen some some strange things back in my uni days i, I worked in bars a lot so i saw mm -hmm. the, the, the the nightlife scene in glasgow in particular glasgow has a, has a reputation yeah. as being a bit of a, a hard city i think that's largely dying now but um you you do you do encounter the occasional things but these are very occasional absolutely things. i think for the most part you'll be extremely safe in scotland and that it's a, it's a great place to uh, to to educate yourself and to go to a university which is chances are one of the most oldest and most established in the world. Yeah, there's a, a Scots saying which I've heard many, many times. Yeah. You're only for all job camps and barons. Yeah. Right? Basically, we're all people just trying to get by. We all ultimately come from the same place, and that is very much the spirit which I found to be almost universally imbued. Yeah, which is incredibly welcoming. 
Good to hear. <laughs> okay, what have we got next? Right, um, so this is uh, an issue I know is, uh, well, dear to both of our hearts, really, but you've got a bit more experience in this domain than I do. Okay. Um, and this is, what is your favourite whiskey? It's, uh, Jack Daniels? Uh, oh, God, no. <laughs> um, uh, this is a long answer. I mean, we could be here for a while. So let's, let's think. It depends largely, and I'm a strange person. I don't have one favourite whiskey. I... Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the time of year. That's a big, it's a strange thing to say, but mm-hmm. I am quite seasonal when it comes to whiskey. And mm-hmm. in winter, this time of year, it's a bit cold. Yeah. Um, the rain's lashing against the window, the windy outside, horrible. Um, I can't help but go to Isla. It just seems like the right fit. Um, smoky, peaty whiskies that taste a little bit medicinal at times, but they'll blow your head off kind of flavours. <laughs> um, and they just give you that kind of fiery warmth that yeah. like, you're looking for. It's like you're taking a bite of the fireplace. Yeah, yeah. 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 Very, very heavy. Um, but that only exists on Isla. Mm. And I, I wouldn't appreciate that kind of flavour on a, a warm sunny evening, for example. I'd be more likely to go to a space site. So if I'm talking about Islas, my go-tos tend to be things like uh, Lafroy Quarter Cask, which is, is delicious. Uh, Lagavulin 16, mm. um, also very, very good. Uh, Ron Swanson's favourite whiskey, for those right? Parts of Rec fans okay, out there. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Ardbeg, I mean, uh, even an Ardbeg 10. So age is not necessarily a determinant in whether it's good or not, or, but mm. it will affect the price of the whiskey. Uh, but Ardbeg is, is quite a premium brand. So even their young stuff tends to be quite pricey, but even an Ardbeg 10, Oh, if, you, if you're looking for, for smoky PC, that's your answer. So those are the, the, the Isla ones I would tend to lean towards. All readily available-ish. And none of them particularly cheap, but all very good in the winter months. And in the summer months, I go towards Speyside, and you're never going to be let down by the likes of a Macallan or, or a Cardew. In terms of the Highland ones as well, Glen Goyne, the 18 and 21 are delicious. Dalmore doesn't do many things wrong. And the Dalwini 15 is another favourite of mine. I think I might have covered most of my favourites there. It's pretty well stocked shelf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Um, and uh, given that most vid- uh, visitors to Scotland will be starting out their time here um, in one of two places, almost certainly Edinburgh and Glasgow, um, from those places, using them as bases, what do you recommend as day trips, uh, particularly you know from the from Glasgow way? Right, so uh, Glasgow... It's number one attraction is its proximity to Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park, one of only two national parks in Scotland. But within 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you are in the wilderness. You have found yourself a, a little slice of heaven. There are so many walking opportunities in the National Park, with obvious ones like Conic Hill or Ben Lomond are particularly popular. Ben Anne is another one. You're going to get a lot of people there, though. If you're looking for something a little bit a little bit further away from the crowds, you could be looking at maybe Ben Vane or Ben Vorlich at Loch Lomond. Uh, ben Venue and, and the Trossachs as well is another, is another good one. So there's, there's literally dozens though, uh, and these are all day trip stuff from Glasgow. So you don't need to worry about accommodation or anything. You can go back to Glasgow at the end of the day, but you've had a full day in the outdoors. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also historic sites not far from Glasgow as well. Oh, tons. I mean, you've got the oldest continually occupied fortified site anywhere in the British Isles um, just outside Glasgow in the form of Dumbarton Rock oh, yes. um, which I've compared to Casterly Rock in Game of Thrones um, it's an absolutely magnificent place and it always stuns me how few people have heard of it mm-hmm. and many people who live in Glasgow have never been out yeah. to Dumbarton Rock yeah. and I'm like are you nuts this is a great place um, so you've got Dumbarton Rock you've got Bothwell Castle just yeah. along the Clyde yeah. as well um, you can always do um, a little island trip as well. Um, the isles are not as far as you might think from Glasgow. It is very, very easy to pop out to the Cumbries, to mm-hmm. pop out to the Isles of Bute or the Isle of Arran, Scotland in miniature yeah. with mountains that are, for my money, just as dramatic as anything you'll find up in the Cairngorms yeah. or Sky or anything. So there's loads of options. Um, and if you're starting out from the Edinburgh way, I mean, where do you even start, right? But um, one of my favourite uh, areas to go to is actually East Lothian um, because there's great public transport links, train, bus, I cycle everywhere, so it's great for that because there's no hills that are too crazy challenging, but it's still enough to get the heart pumping a bit. Um, so many great castles, stunning coastlines and beaches, dramatic little rock-cut harbours, views out to Bass Rock. Um, it's just a brilliant area, and I've started to go a lot more down to the borders as well. Um, 
I know we talked about this with sort of the idea of over tourism, but um, you know, just going down to the border is again about forty five minutes by train from Edinburgh to um, Tweed Bank, which is just outside of Melrose with its famous abbey where Robert Bruce's heart is buried. And you know, from there there's all kinds of areas for uh, mountain biking, for you know, walking the Abbey's trail, and that's Walter Scott country, of course. Yes. You know, if it's good enough for Walter Scott, it's good enough for us, that's yeah, for sure. Definitely. And you've covered it, a lot of it, the classics there. I mean, mm -hmm. North Berwick's the kind of default. Definitely. Go, go to if a sunny day, go and an ice cream in North Berwick or something. Get a boat trip out to the Isle of May, go and see the puffins, Ooh, that yeah. kind of thing as well. But the Lothians that surround Edinburgh are just packed with historic sites, also some great walks. The Pentland Hills, mm -hmm. beauty as well, just outside of Edinburgh. At Melrose, Eildon Hills as well. So great outdoor attractions too. And some good distilleries as well, even there's some whiskey Actually, distilleries yeah. in the Lowlands too. So we've got time for maybe one more question. We're talking, we touched on uh, cycling just briefly there. So yeah. what's uh, what's Scotland like for cyclists and you are the man with the bikes? Right. Um, so if you've been following along for a while, you know that I, I tend to, you know, spend quite a bit of time going out to castles, so I have to say. <sighs> yeah, so. I've been to uh, about not to be precise or anything, we were at 411 Scottish <laughs> castles so far, not keeping track at all. Um, and each and every one of those locations, in addition to hundreds of standing stones, battlefields, you name it, I have reached by bicycle. Um, I'm not an Olympian. Far from it. I love a good night in on the couch eating a bunch of chips. So um, I am not a uh, pro athlete by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but one of the great things about Scotland is that, for instance, you can take um, bikes on trains. And um, while I've had some, shall I say, not ideal experiences in that, because there aren't many cycle spots on a lot of trains going to a lot of areas, the Highlands in particular. That is starting to improve. Um, they've announced that on the West Highland line, for instance, there will be an entire carriage on trains dedicated ah, to cycle storage, excellent. which is going to crack that region wide open. Um, there's only a few incredibly challenging areas. If you go up to the Northwest, places like mm. Torridon and Applecross and all that, yeah. then you're talking huge hills that you do have to be very fit to handle. Um, you know, you go into the Cairn Gorm somewhere like, you know, Cockbridge with the, mm. the left you know, that infamous yes. hill. Yeah. Um, but by and large, Scotland is a brilliant place to cycle in um, because you can very easily construct a trip to be either quite challenging or moderate or quite easy in the same area. Um, there are a lot of established cycle paths as well, national trails, as well as just nice quiet side roads as well that are very leisurely to go along. Um, so from now about eight years of experience cycling throughout Scotland, um, I can say that, you know, in my experience, it is just incredibly accessible to do by bike and you can totally fine tune it to whatever degree of difficulty you want to take on. Super. Mm. So that brings to a close uh, part one, I think, of at least two, probably three videos we'll be doing, mm -hmm. three episodes we'll be doing on uh, the FAQs because we do get a lot of them. Yeah. We've got lots of experience in this. Hopefully this is useful to you. But if you have any further questions that you want us to bring up in, in the next episodes, do let us know in the comments. Yeah, that's what we're here for. So fire away and we look forward to hearing your questions.